good morning, or depending on where you are, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, I'm Alberto Zucconi, one of the two facilitators of this uh, panel. The other is uh, Janani Harish, and uh, uh, I'm from uh, the Person Center Approach Institute, uh, World Academy, and World uh, University Consortium. And I really want to thank uh, all the panelists uh, that have been uh, preparing for this session, uh, uh, meeting several times online and interacting. But also, I wish uh, to really thank all the people that in this panel, you're not going to see your face, uh, but we put uh, all the names uh, on the website uh, uh, because are the many people that have been working and are working even now to make this possible. So thank you very much uh, to the WAS support group and everybody else. Uh, this panel, we're going to deal with the issues of uh, health, well-being, and welfare for a sustainable future and uh, also for fostering uh, uh, sustainable leadership uh, that is going to guide through achieving uh, the goals uh, that we need to achieve uh, in order to have a future, not only sustainable, but we are, we are intended not to have a future. So uh, I want uh, to invite uh, everybody to think uh, that uh, not only we need the sustainable uh, leadership, uh, but we need the sustainable thinking and sustainable planning. We know very much some of the problems. For example, we've been uh, trained, I'm a clinical psychologist, and I teach uh, to medical colleagues. We have been trained uh, to see in a mechanicistic, uh, reductionistic uh, way the issues of health, well being, welfare. That is a part of the problem and not a solution. Also, to see health and well being uh, in the field uh, of health uh, and not in the field uh, of social health. Uh, which, of course, uh, is not just a matter of the Ministry of Health or Welfare Ministry. Health, welfare, well-being are created and supported in every aspect of the social construct of reality, meaning in the culture, in the interaction, in the schooling, but also how television represented those issues, how in kindergarten and elementary school these issues are tackled. So we need a lot of changes, but we also don't need uh, to reinvent the wheel from scratch. We, need, we know that there are some excellent, uh, good practices uh, that do work, uh, and they are also cost effective. Just uh, to give you an example, I work in the field uh, of health promotion and protection. We know that uh, using uh, the natural leaders in a community and to empower them, uh, to give them voice, is highly effective uh, instead of sending some expert, expert that teach uh, in a culture where they don't know anything about uh, how to do it uh, with a great uh, level of uh, power differential. So if uh, we want uh, to uh, have a, a sustainable future, we have to foster from the grassroots uh, the emerging uh, of new leaders. And that is possible. And that also 
we have a lot of learning to do, and uh, more than teaching, that uh, we have uh, connect with the possibility of learning, learning also from mistake, uh, and on, not only for best practice. So we're gonna explore uh, with all the panelists uh, and you listening, posing question, uh, all we can uh, in the allotted time of ninety minutes. Janani, please. Thank you, Alberto. Thank you for inviting me to this panel. I'm very happy to be here. I am Janani Ramanathan, Research Associate at the Mother's Service Society, India, and a fellow of WAS. It was very good to listen to Alberto and the way he initiated this conversation. These times have made it uh, clear more than ever what our priorities are or should be. In these times, I, we see that there are two types of leaders who have uh, categorized themselves into these two, uh, two types. One, leaders who have placed human welfare, well-being and health above everything else. And there is this other category that uh, has placed the economy and, and, and jobs and the World Bank above everything else. And uh, the result of these two types of you know, functioning, what happens when you place human welfare above everything else and what happens when you relegate it to the bottom. It's very clear in the, in, in, in the way things have panned out in the, in, in the health sector in that country. So I believe that this is the most important factor of human health, welfare, and well-being. And I believe our discussion here will bring up a lot of these very, very important truths. So I hand over to the other speakers. Alberto, would you like me to start raising all the questions one by one now? Yes, and uh, uh, Isabel that now has joined us. Uh, okay. uh, ciao, Isabel. Welcome. Hello, Alberto. It's the first one. So. Okay, I would oh, just... Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Alberto. I am uh, so happy to be uh, with you today for this uh, so important topic. And uh, it is uh, an honor and privilege uh, to, to have this uh, session together. And thanks again to, uh, to UN and to us uh, for uh, this amazing opportunity for us to, to discuss uh, uh, the leadership of 21th uh, century. And I would like to focus uh, special attention, uh, I think it's perfect transition with uh, Janani, uh, about the type of leadership, what we need, you know, for uh, for uh, this time, and I would like I, I would like to uh, focus specifically uh, on what type of shift uh, we need, in fact, about leadership. And specifically, yesterday uh, I have been able to follow the discussion, and it was very well mentioned uh, distributed leadership. And I would like to use this opportunity to focus on this aspect and why it is important to uh, address distributed leadership and specifically for one of my organization, World Health Organization, you know, and how to do that, you know. First, um, what it is a big challenge we face uh, and why uh, we need this shift of paradigm. First, because we have uh, seen, unfortunately, a lot of many mechanical thinking, you know, leader, and this type of thinking could never know what will be necessary for transformation. That it is the first point. The other point it is the, on the fact the standardized leadership means separable, countable, numerical aspect of properties, behavior, what it is effectively uh, in, uh, in link with uh, this type of leadership based on, only on economic. Uh, purpose and not all the value, uh, not all the human value. And what we have seen, it is very interesting because with uh, COVID-19 crisis, it, is, it was an opportunity for us to uh, have cognitive reframe. 
And uh, I will be a little bit provocative with the COVID uh, letters because I will uh, formulate uh, this COVID, uh, you know, letters under C for courage to face adversity or like opportunity to go within, within this crisis, you know, of leadership we face. V for validation of our humanness. I to go to inner work leading to healing and empowerment. D for demonstration of resilience. And uh, the crisis can be seen as an opportunity to rethink and to revise, you know, uh, our organization, our structure, the way we will lead for the future. And the question mark it is, what does this experience mean to you? And specifically after, after this period of COVID-19. Uh, In terms of the shift of the way we are thinking, what have been the statu quo for a long time? Uh, we have seen, you know, what we call linear thinkers. And what does it mean? It is mean, you know, you break things into component piece, uh, you are specifically only concerned by the content. You try to fix symptoms. You are concerned with, uh, with assigning blame. You try to control, you know, chaos to create order. Uh, you care only about the content of communication and not the way you communicate. Uh, you believe organizations are predictable and can be in, always in order. But we need to shift to system thinking, system thinker. And that it was really the focus of WHO for many years, specifically how we can uh, take in consideration the whole picture, you know, we can uh, take attention to the process leading to the outcome. It is as well the concern with the underlying dynamics between, for example, different sectors, different disciplines, it is to try to identify patterns and it is as, as well to care about the content but uh, as well uh, to the interaction and pattern of communication. And we need to consider now the organization need to address what it is unpredictable, you know, in this very chaotic environment. And for that, we need to move towards a new model. And from this new model, we, we have a new context. This new context, it is the demographic and social, societal shift we, we need to address. For example, to consider intergenerational, you know, and diversity as well as the, the main elements of this new context. We need to consider the new technologies. Uh, we, have, we have seen that during uh, COVID-19 with the role of social media, digitalization, you know, and, and through that, uh, what type of transparency, you know, we need to have through this complexity of media. The other point, it is the globalization, you know, and how we, have, we are all interdependent. We have more and more uh, different stakeholders need to uh, work together, to collaborate together. And this uh, aspect of multi-stakeholder approach is absolutely critical to address and it was mentioned yesterday, uh, poverty, you know, but as well, you know, how we go beyond the national boundaries. And, and specifically, we need as well to, to consider when the resources are uh, not um, available. And for this new model of leadership, uh, we need to have clear purpose and to consider three uh, key elements, emotional, and what is uh, the part of emotional? It is our values, the courage, the belief, the empathy, and the self-awareness, and as well the altruism. The, the other part, it is the intellectual aspect, and we need to have new set of skills, including creativity, innovation, passion. Uh, we, dis we, we have mentioned the importance of our view, the world view, what it is, the system view, you know, and what are the patterns related to that. So Please, other... Isabel, conclude because uh, your time yeah, is sure. up. It's, it's uh, almost finished. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and the other key aspect, it is a social aspect. 
And for that, we need to consider, uh, you know, the importance of ecosystem, relationship, communication, community, uh, to build alliance, uh, and as well the importance of collaboration. And just to finish, the 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 the, the presentation it is to uh, lead to a new journey for us, you know, uh, together. And this new journey, it is uh, to have the opportunity, in fact, to uh, reflect not as I, but as we, you know, and, and specifically what legacy we will give to the young generation and how we can uh, shift uh, our view on, on leadership to have more uh, human value in, in the center and, and to be people center. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you very much, Isabel. And now is uh, Stefan. Eh? And uh, Stefan, it's five minutes uh, for each uh, round. Uh, and uh, please introduce uh, yourself uh, as you best uh, see fit. Yeah. Well, thank you very much again for joining this uh, group and joining this session on, on uh, wealth health, well-being, and welfare. I'm um, a medical director. I'm running a hospital here in um, the midst of Germany. And the question I've got asked by Alberto and the convener group is, I had to answer the question, why do we need integral medicine? Why do we need an integral approach in medicine? And in order to do so, um, I actually wanted to show you some slides, but apparently the host doesn't allow me to do so. <laughs> oh, I can, no, 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 we will make that team just to You make that happen for me? Uh, I will stay within the five minutes. Don't worry. I will speak a little bit faster. But, uh, yes, Sorry, you can start sharing your screen now. Yes. I can now? Yes, yes. Yeah. yes. No, no. <laughs> no. We can see. Yeah. That's what it is. Wonderful. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I will stay within five minutes. I have to answer the question, why we need an integral approach in medicine. Okay. And in order to ask that question, I have to follow a protocol. And the protocol is first the problem. The problem is that Western medicine, yet extremely powerful in dealing with acute illnesses, provides very poor evidence in chronic conditions. We have evidence that only about 20% of what we're doing in medicine follows A1 evidence, right? Only 20%, the rest is just empirical based. We know that 90% of our empirical evidence is pharma sponsored and only 50% is published. So the real evidence for Western medicine is very poor. The source for that is that Western medicine is basically based on a reductionist and materialistic approach. You know, conventional medicine is extremely theory sensitive. You know, once we, once we change the view on signs and symptoms, we basically change everything, you know? And conventional medicine is extremely powerful if it comes to acute intensive care on imaging, on labs, surgery, and drugs but it's very poor if it comes to chronic stress associated conditions. And since 2000, the chronic stress associated conditions are by far representing the highest mortality than infectious diseases in the past. What are the solutions? The solutions are that we have to honor the achieve achievements in Western medicine, but we have to transcend them towards a more integral approach. We actually, as a world community and as a um, healthcare community, simply do not know enough in order not to look at other systems. And this is how it could look like, you know? A map is not the territory, but it can help us to navigate towards a more integral approach where we start considering the subjective side and the collective side, where we start considering the inner part and the outer part. And the strategy how to get there is that the first time in medical history, beginning with the 21st century, we can witness and access 
all the wisdom, all the knowledge, all the skills and experience of all medical systems on this planet, right? Nobody is 100% wrong. Every, every component we can learn from all other medical systems that they're true, but they're partial, right? And we can learn from most, not all, but from most medical systems that the, the effect of measuring medical air outcome depends to a much higher degree on parameters which are outside of the medical system than within the medical system, okay? The two most prominent ones are in the 21st century hygiene. Hygiene has basically has changed mortality in infectious diseases far earlier than in the antibiotics did. And the second big one where Leonard is now speaking about is basically the social determinants of health, right? So the causes of the causes. So I would like to summarize that it is not the medical system, the conventional medical system itself, but it's more the extra moral activities like hygiene, like the environment that determine the outcomes in medicine. And if we want to shift from a more conventional materialistic perspective, it's a mind shift that's required. And if you want to know more about it, how it works, you can visit me at my hospital. We are treating several thousand people inpatient and outpatient in neurology and in psychiatry, acute and chronic, over the last 10 years very successfully. And we are applying an integral approach and we are pretty successful in doing so. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, we need a medical doctor uh, well aware of that, uh, and especially for the social construction uh, of new doctor and personnel, see how they and we all can be part of the solution and not of the problem. Now, next speaker, Janani, uh, please uh, I will introduce. Yes, uh, Steph. And if you could please stop sharing, uh, we will be able to see all the videos. We're still uh, seeing uh, your screen. How can I do that? Ah, stop. Yes, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Our next, oh, yeah. Our next speaker, Dr. Leonard Levy, Emeritus Professor of Karolinska Institute, Sweden, and Fellow of WAS. Dr. Levy, we have a question for you. Rethinking higher education to promote health, well being, and welfare. This would you like to comment on this? And you would please need to unmute your mic. The bottom left, it's still muted. Unmute uh, your mic, Leonard. On the bottom left, there is yeah. this. Now, again, again, <laughs> try again. All no, right, yes. please. Now we hear well, you. Well, the question is. Can rethinking higher education solve some of our problems? The problems are how to promote health, well-being, and welfare. Next, next slide, please, if you may. Well, uh, there are I'm no sorry, slides. No, forget yeah. about the slides. The uh, World Economic Forum every year makes a report on global risks. If you look at the last report from this year, 2020, you've seen that there are hundreds of risks. And in addition to that, they are interlinked. So how on earth can we deal with such a complexity? Well, particularly so when we look at the present situation in the world, approximately 10% of the world's population live in extreme poverty. Extreme poverty, not just a little bit, but extreme. And according to Amartya Sen, economic growth without investment in human development is unsustainable and unethical. So the way to treat all this is to apply what the United Nations and their 193 
fellow states have decided concerning Agenda 2030. It has 17 Sustainable Development Goals and 169 targets. Target 4.7 reads, ensure that all participants acquire by 2030 the knowledge and skills needed to promote sustainable development and lifestyles, including education in human rights, gender equality, peace, nonviolence, global citizenship, appreciation of diversity and respect for the role of culture. So we have a mandate, not just from one organization, but from all the countries of the world. I hope they have understood what, what, they, what the meaning of this mandate. So what we need to do is rethinking higher education my alma mater, the Karolinska Institute, has started doing that, is in the process of doing that, implementing all these ideas into medical education. And that includes critical thinking, ethical thinking, system thinking, and Agenda 2030 thinking. Easy to say, not easy to do, but fully possible. So, dear colleagues, do it, do it. Start doing it and start doing it now. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Leonard. Uh, so important, your message. Uh, and uh, Professor Leonard Levy is uh, one of the main uh, uh, people that uh, made the, the Poznan Declaration uh, asking uh, for all the university in whatever subject matter, to put uh, the teaching uh, of ethics uh, as uh, one of the main aspects of the curriculum, a very important aspect of the social construction of reality and uh, of social health. So thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you. So, May I go? Yes, Alberto. May I go ahead? Yeah. So next uh, speaker is uh, our friend and colleague, uh, Faris. Uh, Faris, uh, you are supposed to, to introduce yourself. Uh, if I introduce you, I would uh, waste all your five minutes to do that. Please unmute yourself. You have to unmute. <laughs> unmute it on the left. Uh, Can you hear me now? Yeah, yep. Uh, dear participants and colleagues, uh, greetings to all. Uh, Faris Gavran Kapetanovic, coming from Bosnia and Herzegovina, fellow of us. Uh, I'm working 36 years in uh, medicine. 12 years I was uh, general director of the largest hospital in Bosnia, two years uh, Ministry of Health of Federation, two years heading the largest health insurance fund. Now I'm the member of this fund. Actually, I prepare a little bit longer uh, lecture according to our meeting today, but I'm going to shortage as much as possible. This morning we had wonderful, fruitful session with Mila Jovovich about the youth, education, and uh, leadership uh, inside of our group. The World Academy of Art and Science decision to organize in collaboration with the United Nations Office in Geneva e conference title strategies for transformative global leadership comes in the right time following the old challenges and the lessons the humankind received recently as a consequence of outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic. Firstly, the speed of uh, outbreak of Corona-19 virus was a huge Paris, surprise. excuse me, for people that are not the mother tongue in English, it might be difficult little bit, to little understand that uh, you speak so I would like fast. to put a lot, yeah, okay, a little bit uh, uh, slower, yeah. Uh, uh, Firstly, the speed of outbreak of Corona-19 virus was a huge surprise, and even it looked originally as a very distant problem for China, it becomes sooner than later a world problem forcing WHO to name it pandemic. Secondly, it demonstrated in very powerful terms that virus does not recognize economic wealth of an individual nation nor its border. Thirdly, immediate reaction of whole world was individual 
individual closure and fear going back to basic and it flow of unfounded but powerful fake news that have caused not only a sense of panic but overall help to whole planet. Even today as we speak, uh, evident voyage of virus COVID continues even though its first wave had passed through Southeast Asia, uh, European countries, partly Northern America, but we can recognize it in the uh, United States now in South America. And unfortunately, we don't know what are the relevant information for the African countries. Even though when uh, my state opened the borders just uh, two weeks ago, we have increased the number of the patients from coronavirus. At the same time, coronavirus is showing, uh, when, uh, showing us when humanity is united in common cause. Phenomenally rapid change is possible. None of the world problems are technically difficult to solve. They originate in human disagreement. COVID-19 demonstrates the power of our collective will when we agree on what is important. What do we want to achieve and what world shall we create? That is always the next question when anyone awakes to their power. We could have witnessed COVID-19 with enormous effects on our common life, closing the population to their homes, thus creating a new format of not social, but indeed a physical distance. About education and leadership, I will just repeat it that uh, actually there is uh, some kind of uh, knowledge that uh, 85 percentage of uh, lectures which we are giving to our students is body language. We, through this, we have no so powerful body language. You know, this is a losing for the generation, as you mentioned, Alberto, in kindergartens, in uh, primary, secondary school, even at universities. Uh, on this first uh, round, I will perhaps conclude uh, with some kind of the proceed, which is actually covering the process, how can we do it and planning. This is uh, one shortage which was mentioned by Isabel, like uh, COVID-19, she just every letter mentioned there is a, a female name Aida, uh, like uh, where is Aida, uh, which actually uh, put inside a letter A as attention, uh, I is interest, uh, D is desire, and uh, A is act. This is one uh, part of the uh, Deming circle, if you, if you know it, this is P, D, C, A, plan, do, check, act. Always make the circle, uh, have the problem, uh, solving the problem, check that you solve problem, and acting again. Because my uh, uh, view, that uh, this COVID-19 actually surprised the world. Now we, and uh, part of the human society and the World Academy of Art and Science has to give one of the, uh, how can I say, the overall approach, how can we defend the world and humanity in this process. This is uh, for the beginning and later on I can jump in trying to obey these five minutes. Thank you, Alberta. Thank you. Thank you. Janani. Thank you, Ferris. And now, Janani, please announce the next speaker. Our next speaker is Dr. Rodolfo Fiorani. He is Emeritus Professor, Polytechnico di Milano University, Italy, and he's also a trustee of WAS. Dr. Fiorani, I have a question for you. Personal well being and group well being are basic needs for any educated society. Which catalytic strategies are needed to educate current governments all over the world to support them properly? Okay, first of all, thank you, uh, Alberto, for having invited me to this exquisite panel uh, because I have an opportunity to, uh, to communicate uh, my latest findings on uh, well being in the sense that. Uh, uh, ten years ago, I started uh, a, a new course at Polytechnic of Milano that was uh, titled uh, Wellbeing Technology Assessment. And I realized that at that time there was uh, a lot of confusion about the term of well-being because uh, uh, on different supports uh, you could find uh, well hyphen being or just well-being as, as, as one word used with the same meaning. Uh, and so 
uh, uh, I started with my students uh, a, a deep research around, and uh, and then uh, in 2012 we arrived to a, a nice a nice paper that is. Um, a, a, a just uh, a complete that was completely different from the, from the past approaches. That was a paper for Dodge, Daly, Eitan, and Sanders, and provided a definition of well-being, focusing it as a state of equilibrium, equilibrium or balance that can be affected by life events or challenges. Therefore, well-being values are stable when we have enough the resources to meet life challenges. And this and this is a, a quite uh, interesting definition because it can be applied to any culture, can be applied to any level of uh, 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 arbitrary scale system. In the sense that you can use at personal level, you can use it at group level, at community level, and uh, any 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 like you uh, any any time you like. And so. Uh, I think, and then, and, and that con this concept is addressing three different levels of well-being uh, grouped together in the sense of the physical level, the individual personal level, and the social level. And we can find a, a, a parallel to the past approach of Pierre de Chardin, Tyler de Chardin, or just uh, um, uh, Vernaski. Uh, that uh, of uh, geo, geo, geosphere, biosphere, and non-sphere. And so we find a, a, a f the full harmony of the approach immediately mapped from the universe to individual and vice versa. It's a, a completely new shift from the, from the past view. But I think that we need to refer to this, point, this view because uh, uh, it's fundamental for the future. And uh, it, uh, if anybody is interested uh, I th on, the, on the Academy website for this research project, you find a, 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 a paper uh, of mine that, that just uh, uh, describes this, this approach uh, in more details. So uh, uh, I'd like really to share this information with you because uh, uh, you are in a position to understand uh, the, the deep uh, meanings uh, meaning of, of this uh, new approach and all the in development uh, and relationship that you can have uh, it's a completely new research area a lot of development in, in can be open i mean uh, just referring to this approach and uh, ethics is just inside this approach because as, as soon as you refer to the individual, to the person, you have just to refer immediately to the unicity of each individual and, and his or her rights. And, and so, is something automatic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rodolfo. And uh, uh, please, uh, uh, keep in mind that uh, Rodolfo wrote a beautiful paper and so many others uh, of the panelists uh, or put uh, some uh, relevant uh, material and uh, all this material are free for your, you know, download and consultation. Uh, and uh, this uh, uh, conference, uh, the whole conference, not just this panel, is recorded and so would last uh, actually several years uh, available anybody interested online and also you might want uh, to see some of the paper we wrote for example this uh, panel just published uh, a common written uh, paper from our process uh, or our meeting that has been just published uh, from Cadmus. Uh, and you can have a free subscription online uh, of Cadmus uh, and Irudito to scientific journal interdisciplinary and intersectorial that are given away for free by the World Academy of Art and Science. So that's now time to welcome uh, Tatiana Buzzetti, that actually I didn't have the pleasure to know until. Chris Brown, that is the head of the Venice Who 
Europe Center for uh, Health and, and Development and Prosperity could not come to this plan uh, as planned to this panel. So she sent a, a really important uh, person uh, to substitute her input. Uh, and so now we really welcome Tatiana Buzzetti. Maybe from now on, uh, we know you and uh, we can uh, keep in touch. Uh, and Tatiana, please uh, introduce uh, yourself. You're a very important person and I don't want to waste uh, so much time introducing. So you choose uh, how to present yourself to the audience. Thank you very much, Alberto, for this nice uh, introduction. I am a policy officer for multi-sectoral approaches for health equity in a Venice office because the prime focus of WHO... Tatiana, excuse me for interrupting. Can you be so kind uh, to raise your voice? Uh, some people, as old than me, might have uh, some trouble to really get into what you say. Okay, better. Uh, so, uh, Venice office in particular focuses on health equity, so on investments in health that benefit really across the whole population and taking care, leaving no one behind. And if we look only into two reports, really very important last year, the first one being from European Union, looking into the progress that our region is doing in uh, meeting the commitments under Agenda 2030, we see that we do in all 16 SDGs either significant or moderate improvements, while there is one where the progress is negative. And this is the SDG 10, the equality target. So it doesn't say that we are not doing anything about that, but that here we have a specific challenge that we have to learn to do things better. And in particular, COVID-19 crisis is showing that again. If you look into the second report, that's Health Equity Status Report from uh, WHO Europe published uh, last year in September, which is nicely giving an overview of inequities in the region, but also explaining the key reasons for this and offering also, also some solutions and showing that actually we do know which macroeconomic policies can reduce inequities. And that's the important message also for policymakers that that can be achieved in two to four years. So if you look into the seven of those, invest so in reduction of income inequality, reduction in unemployment rate, uh, reduction in out-of-pocket payments and expenditure, increase in social protection, increase in public expenditure on health, increase in public expenditure on labor market policies, and increase in public expenditure on housing and amenities. All governments have these policies in their portfolio, being the local, regional, or the national ones. But we also learned from the report that it's not enough to invest in one or two of them, but that you need this basket to address it in proportion how it's required. And COVID actually posed again a very nice challenge to that because it, it's not enough only to respond as a healthcare system uh, with all the measures that were in first hand crucial, but that now also the social, that education, environment, community needed to respond quickly, securely to address the needs. And in particular, the challenge was addressing the needs, the most marginalized people that often couldn't comply with the required measures. So our message that went across already last year to work on the basket of policies, to take into account the policy coherence and accountability as a key drivers of health equity are even more relevant. 
So, but if we know all that, there is something that we have to change in our policy making. So it's not enough that we only know what to do, but we have to change how we do it. And this is in particular you now the, the focus in what we are looking at. And I think here, the education, the training, the new skills development, and in particular also for health system people that are the front line front advocates for health, well-being, equity, are crucial. And here we are putting on the table that the public policy cannot be anymore only delivered. It needs to be co-produced. The solution space needs to be redefined and that by the people that are in the end using the solutions and that is actually changing their lives. So the participatory and authoritarian processes are for us the key process. And here the social and human capital that we are creating in the society from across the life course, early stage, across the primary, secondary, higher education, as well as keeping in mind the lifelong learning and later life uh, capacities acquired along this group of people that can be also shared. So that's maybe for the starting point in uh, oh, my thinking, and I could come back later on some of these uh, points. Great. Thank you, Tatiana. By the way, I read that the people put, a, a, several people put the question, uh, it's the same question, how we get access uh, to the free, uh, you know, supporting material. And maybe, Janani, you are the best uh, to answer that question, uh, which uh, we are very happy to have. <laughs> yes, I have just pasted the links in both the chat and the Q&A box. All the material related to this conference, the working papers and the background papers, all of them are available on the WAS site. We will post them again in the chat. Under the conference page, all of them are available. And after this conference is over, the questions that were raised, all those questions that maybe could not be answered, all the video recordings, they will also be uploaded to the WAS website. Great, thank you. So uh, now we go to a second round uh, of uh, question, uh, and I'll give uh, something general so each one uh, can uh, you know, choose uh, how to answer. We started with uh, saying uh, that, uh, you know, uh, the issue of health, welfare, and uh, well-being uh, are not uh, limited uh, to where were, you know, in the past, uh, like uh, to those uh, secluded area. But uh, well-being uh, and uh, welfare are everywhere, the social construction of society in the different aspects uh, and intersectorially produce uh, uh, the result of the last result. What I want to toss uh, to everybody is a question. What do you think uh, are some uh, of the worst barrier to reach uh, what you propose uh, and how we can uh, overcome just one or an example of good practice uh, that have been uh, able to you know, bring us forward uh, because we desperately need uh, to move ahead uh, as you have underlined uh, with different emphasis. So who wants to start first? Isabel. Yes, I can, uh, can start. Uh, thank you very much for this question, uh, Alberto. I think it's a very important question. And effectively, you can have the best intention in the world, but if you have so many barriers, it will be difficult, you know? And for me, the issue uh, we face, and specifically for big organizations, you know, it is uh, the model of governance. You know, we have uh, mentioned you know, this aspect of policy making, but that the, the type of governance, and specifically the fact, and it was very well mentioned as well um, by, um, by uh, Tadjana, uh, about uh, you know the, the co co development co creation you know and we are very far from that why because the governance model today you know in many organizations don't allow this type of uh, way of working 
And if you have not the right governance model in place, you cannot, you know, uh, you cannot establish this, uh, this new foundation. It's impossible. So for that, we need to review, for example, again, uh, the, the, how we, we implement distributed leadership. For example, what I have done myself uh, through a new initiative by our director general in WHO called Art Impact for Health, it was to review the way we, we are working with the different stakeholders. First, it is not to exclude, as you mentioned so well, multi-sectorial approach, it is in practice. So it is not to, ex to have just, for example, researcher, policy maker, representative of civil society from the health sector, but as well from environment, you know, from the energy field, uh, from the social science field, you know, all these players together, that I think it is the first you know, big steps to do. And uh, in this initiative, we have decided as well to promote art, you know, and to promote as well the use, not of just science, but science and art together. So that is, for me, it's a big step because it is an effective way to, um, to apply multidisciplinary uh, and, and multi-stakeholders uh, approach. Uh, but it is not enough. It is the first step, but in, it is not enough. And I think the, 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 to finish, uh, what is very important in terms of governance cities to review how we, we will distribute, you know, the asset, the resource, how we value, you know, the, the human being in, in this structure. And that it is, we are not yet here, you know what I mean? What is the, the value of, of human? What it is their level of creativity give, in fact, uh, not just economic, you know, value, what we discuss, but something with more big purpose. Over to you. Thank you very much, Isabel. Ferris is uh, next. Can you hear me, Alberto? Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, actually, on the end of my first uh, speech on this session, I mentioned the uh, female name, Aida di Verdi Opera, what does it mean? Uh, it uh, break through the Suez uh, Channel, which actually connected the Mediterranean Sea and the uh, Red Sea and in the ocean. It was one of the giant uh, uh, moved which civilization done in 19th century. What do we uh, know, uh, do now to break through the borders? I mean to make our uh, uh, whole knowledge together to actually find uh, well-being and uh, added value to, to the civilization. I put some of the uh, small shortages. Uh, we have to recognize important, long-lasting, profound effects. For instance, we can say now about uh, Corona-19 virus, know that effects will go beyond and health issues. Believe that important lessons need to be learned and uh, overall uh, uh, practices changes throughout societies and world, especially in our individual and collective health system. And we remain committed to global exchange of knowledge, experiences, best practices in order to, preser to preserve and improve health and well being of world population. Convinced that the proper education and upper bringing based on altruistic, equal for all, and truthful approach where key and improved role will be given to teachers. We would like to suggest uh, that our efforts also focus on role on importance, new formats of education and teaching in order to avoid clash between improved technologies and the virus for forced need to stay home. One should not forget to mention following experience that should be considered in medical terms to storm of fear that was brought to the, through the world with the sudden and first extremely dramatic outbreak of Corona-19 virus has brought many individual countries to halt. Immediately, reaction of closure, quarantine approach was the first major reaction and measure that helped emergency services and namely hospitals to try and get a grip on unforeseen challenge. 
this will be some kind of the possible approach. How can we break through the borders which we have it now? And what was the problem in the beginning of the coronavirus? Each state has its own leadership approach. How can they actually protect themselves? Now we have to work on this. How can the world, I mean, the whole civilization and society through our organization, VAS, can give some kind of the uh, possible uh, answers of, on this problem. Thank you, Faris. Next. Stefan wants to speak. Would be, uh, can I speak? I Stefan, it's you, yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. If you look at the, um, at the SDGs in general and at the SDGs associated to welfare, health, and medicine in specific, you find a very high global consensus about where we want to go, right? So, for example, we know that collective insurance is superior to out-of-pocket payments, you know, etc. So, if you ask me about the single most important thing that makes a difference, it is reframing the financial system, reframing the monetary system to allow to finance SDGs in general and or to finance these specific healthcare goals in, in specific. It's not a problem of um, empirical evidence. We have all the evidence out there. What was missing is coming up with a very good story, a very good design that allows us to finance the goals we've agreed in the first place. Yeah. Thank you. Very, very, very important. Uh, uh, Stefan just uh, wrote a book and is very active uh, in this uh, Field. Uh, Leonard, uh, to speak, uh, you need uh, to unmute uh, your mic. Uh, please unmute uh, your mic. Yes. Uh, oh, there no. you go. Oh, is it okay? We hear you now. You hear me? Okay. I would like to give you an example of something that worked. Uh, I have been a member of the Swedish parliament for four years. Not now, I'm too old. But during that time, I got to know quite a number of the top level politicians. I knew that in January of this year, there was a session about mental health, how to promote it. And that traditionally belongs to the parliament, the parliamentary um, uh, group of, of uh, social support, social, social questions. So I had a conversation with that chairman and she said, and I said, why not invite the other committee? such as labor, such as uh, industry, such as social, uh, well, you know, quite a number of them. And she said, I will try. She asked the top administrator of the Swedish parliament and asked whether this would be allowed or not. Is it according to the rules or not? And he said, it is okay. It's never done, but you can try. Why not? So she invited four other groups, parliamentary uh, committees. No, five more. So they were a total of six discussing in a much more effective manner what is the determinant of mental health and what could be done to remove problems that exist. So that was the beginning. Maybe they will continue in the same spirit to discuss complex problems using all the resources available and not just health, medicine, and so on. Very, very, very important. Uh, uh, for example, we all speak about uh, the pandemia of COVID. Uh, but there are other pandemia doing a great damage, racism, sexism, 
bigotry are pandemic and create an incredible loss of social health. Another big pandemia that is been going on since the beginning of the history of humanity is trauma. Children suffer from terrible trauma, ACE, but also we know that we have a beneficial uh, you know, relationship uh, that uh, mitigate trauma. And in terms of the human suffering, and also multiplying the epidemic, uh, because people that have been uh, traumatized uh, then uh, are in a high percentage of two perpetrator of, uh, you know, uh, trauma-provoking uh, relationship. So we know that uh, what, you know, Leonard just said that you cannot work at this issue like is that the Ministry of Health has to be intersectorial. That's why we have a very efficient, cost-effective, intersectorial approach where we train not only parents and teachers, but also managers, also school, juvenile delinquency system. Otherwise, you never go ahead of this, and I take the opportunity to answer a question that was online that there might be other of you, as we continue want to tackle, to say, you cannot be completely in this topic without speaking about big pharma, because it has a, a big impact on health, well-being, and welfare. Yes, I excuse me if I say, I was working for the World Health Organization since many, many years ago. I remember Frank La Perla asked me, he paid $10,000 to me for writing a blueprint to promote change for health promotion. And one of the things I said, well, see the barrier. One of the barrier is some people that fear that if you promote health, that they make less profit big pharma, for example. So I said, it's simple. Promote their interest like you do with the industry that has to reconvert from war times, producing cannon and guns, to peace time where they have to build, you know, prime pans and kitchen material. Incentivate. If a big pharma can be incentivated to sell not only pills, but also help promoting the services, might be we don't have uh, any more, you know, that uh, as opposed. So when you promote the change, uh, one uh, effective tool already in existing, uh, you do a field assessment, uh, who is for, who's neutral, and who's against, and how you can motivate people to join uh, the promotion of change. So we need uh, to exchange uh, knowledge uh, and good practice because uh, we know a lot. It's a problem, uh, how are we gonna do it? And Leonard uh, gave a good example. He was the first one to ask. There was no enemy, uh, but it was not done. So the culture was, well, we don't do that. We discussed that uh, only with the... <laughs> so, and um, let's go ahead and hear the next. Yes, Tatiana, unmute yourself, please. Okay, um, I have three concrete barriers that we are uh, looking to enter it. The first one, I think it was addressed by several uh, speakers by now, working in silos. And I don't mean uh, working in silos only between the governmental sectors like education, environment, health, but sometimes also within our organizations, highly specialized units, not really looking uh, across what others are doing, highly specialized experts really being uh, very, very responsive, uh, adequate for some specific issues. When you want to address a complex person as individuals, we are not enough because you have to get this angle of different views, different 
approaches already into the team in organizations to start to address the challenge? And of course, when you start to go outside the organization, we are talking about the full of government approach and some countries have a very nice examples how they managed to get uh, the national uh, accountability frameworks for health and well-being where all the sectors had to uh, contribute to the targets as well as agenda 2030 is actually a very nice joint accountability framework we don't have to look for a new one we all have to contribute and show how we uh, realize it and how we improve it. Eh? And being on the local level, being on the national level, or being on international level. However, coming to the second uh, barrier here, avoiding the reality of conflicting interests, I don't think it helps. Eh? So recognizing that there are some natural conflicts of interest between sectors, it needs a kind of governance system, not only on the government level, because I'm coming from a small country of 2 million people. Imagine how the government of this country can uh, contrabalance the effects of a global, multinational um, or um, international agreements that are maybe not so beneficial. So, these kind of approaches need to be discussed on all these levels and the governance and the overall uh, health and well-being as an objective addressed through different participation also in the end by NGOs, by civil society that sometimes remind all the other players what it's all about and that the, the third barrier the fictitious average person that we are usually looking into it when reading the report it's not existing that actually there are the lived experience that are very different across the gradient and that if we really commit to leaving no one behind we have to capture this lived experience also in the policy making from most marginalized to the best of and understanding also why the best of might have some conflicting issues when it's coming. So that would be like the three cornerstones that we try to put it and build on it when uh, changing the policy development. Thank you, Tatiana. Rodolfo, do you want to share something? But you had to unmute yourself. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you, Alberto. Uh, well, I think that we, if we like to go to the to the root of the problem, to the to the core. I uh, I mean I have to refer to Stefan, because uh, uh, again, uh, economy and finance are focused on the value of objects, of physical objects only, and uh, and so they don't take in, into consideration any value for the individual, for the biological component, for the social component, unless they are threatened by them. And so you see the pandemic. <laughs> and so they suddenly realize that there is something else, you know, attached to, to, to the individual, you know. And that's the real problem. We, uh, if we continue to value the objects only, uh, there is no solution for, according to my little vision. Thank you. I would like to Can add, I? yes, yes. Uh, to continue with what uh, Rodolfo just said, in India, we have had nearly three months of lockdown now. And this has affected very badly a, a lot of people, but we have 40 million internal migrants within the country. Now, these people do not have the security of their own home. Many of them find themselves without work and income now. And so it is very difficult to implement any, any rule, to impose any rule like lockdown or, or social distancing or any such thing when things are so tough for them. They all wish to go home and there's overcrowding on the trains and when train services start, they have suffered a lot. So going, this is one barrier that I feel is there. Going forward, we have to ensure inclusive development where it is not just some regions that develop, but 
all all over not just the cities but even smaller towns villages so that no region is left behind no group is left behind this will help take address some of the challenges that we have faced during this period so inclusive development and uh, just thinking about every everybody every group that i feel will you know help uh, mitigate some of the difficulties that we are facing right now yeah janani and uh, rodolfo and also stefan had uh, underlined something so important uh, and uh, <laughs> the crazy thing is that uh, we still measure with the wrong uh, matrix uh, that they make us blind uh, like a national or international gross product uh, that doesn't uh, actually help us to see anything and is certainly not to have uh, anything to do with uh, defending and promote the prosperity uh, you know social health uh, individual health uh, well-being uh, actually are not an expense uh, are an investment uh, and produce uh, you know more not less and uh, is uh, totally dysfunctional actually a psychiatric case uh, of how society nowadays uh, still look at things in a mechanistic reductionist thing and in that way actually do efforts and investment uh, that are part of the problem uh, and not of the solution as uh, leonard was saying how we teach people if we still teach people not to see things uh, although we have the tools uh, we have the triple bottom line the quadruple bottom line uh, and so many other parameters that scientifically measure prosperity <laughs> and and uh, still we teach as uh, many of you have point out uh, the wrong way so the social construction of the different uh, profession uh, i would tackle that in a session about the education that we have uh, tomorrow, uh, you know, are blind. It's not that, that the, the evil things are done by evil people. Often uh, we are making ourselves blind. And even in the best intention, for example, I'm collaborating uh, with one of the many uh, collaborating center of this uh, initiative, and one of that is uh, uh, Shoshana Bergman uh, uh, Interparliamentary Coalition uh, for Ethics and a Culture of Peace. For example, I developing, and I'm looking for the money to do it, but uh, to give away for free something that instead of pitching for peace uh, and uh, conflict uh, prevention and resolution, which is a nice thing, but doesn't work. You know, you cannot you know really preach peace you have first of all to be in peace with your different part yourself and be an example a teaching example of peace i call it a sustainable relationship so we're gonna develop and give away for free which is the ics and a form of social health children training their parents uh, about the uh, conflict prevention and conflict resolution in their home and then also training the parents and teachers and be humble sometime uh, we know from uh, you know the natural leaders uh, instead of sending a super good uh, university degree uh, professor to teach in a village uh, to the ignorant people something they should know it's much better to empower natural leaders. They know the culture and can, uh, if we give them the tools, uh, in much less expensively and much more effectively. And we have a scientific data that this works. So what are the, that is blocking us? I think uh, the issue of greed, uh, like uh, somebody asking <laughs> for the big pharma, but also that the people that have power, they're really reluctant uh, to share power because of what everybody do, Ferris, Rodolfo, Tatiana, Isabel, and Leonard, and also Stefan. 
uh, if not as practically mentioned it, you know, all this new way of seeing it, all this way of doing it, include also sharing more power, doing more empowerment. So uh, we don't have a, at the moment a more question from the audience. Uh, I want uh, to ask, and maybe also uh, Janani one, say how we overcome uh, these big, big uh, barriers uh, to change. Uh, do you have some idea, some example, where has been already achieving. Leonard has won, but the first day has to unmute your mic. Sorry, without unmuting your mic, I cannot speak. Not because we're wow. mean. There you go. Well, who are the decision makers of tomorrow? Mm. I think the answer is today's students. So why not teach today's students about Agenda 2030? the 17 uh, Sustainable Development Goals, the 169 targets, and thinking critically, ethically, and in systems. It's not easy, but it is not impossible. It can be done, it is being done, so why don't we provide meals to do that? Right on, Leonard. And your uh, Poznan charter suggested that uh, eloquently. Who else uh, wants to address the issue? I'm sorry, I didn't hear. Who else uh, wants to share something about that? Uh, Rodolfo, unmute uh, your mic. Um, Alberto, thank you. Uh, I like to, to be a little provocative, you know. Think about, uh, think about uh, um, unfortunately, Joe Freud, you know that uh, the guy that uh, got killed by by police, and, uh, uh, and uh, all the issues, uh, all the issues was about uh, twenty dollars. Yeah. Okay. So uh, right now the value of uh, life for uh, or individual life is twenty dollars. I think we have to rise a little. Why not to twenty millions? Why not? 200 millions, why not 2 billion? And then you see the difference. Then you think twice acting on, on, on a person. <laughs> I know. Your provocation is well taken. Isabel, you wanted to speak, and no, Tatiana, sorry. Sorry, Tatiana, I thought it was Isabel. Might be next. <laughs> Tatiana, you have to unmute your mic, though. Okay. okay. I would have um, two starting points. Um, moving from cost benefit analysis to social return on investment, because what would uh, secure the social values in fiscal policies? Because now we are looking only at economic value. And I think that a lot of us are talking about uh, the, this big problem. And the second one would be like the co-production and the participatory approaches as a standard. We have it on paper, but we have to look on how we accelerate this into the practice. So here, I think that the lift experiences, bringing all these methodology and good examples where we have high participation, in policy development as well as in implementation could play important role. Thank you very much. Is it Isabel uh, first, I think? Thank you. Yes, I think one, one element is very important for me. It is as well, you know, to um, consider uh, uh, inside, you know, development and not just outside. And that I think it's very important and in alignment with what we discuss about, you know, health promotion, uh, health prevention and, and, and so on. And, and for example, uh, human, uh, our well-being and our health, it is first about not just physical, you know, well-being, but uh, psychological well-being. And I think we need to explore, you know, uh, again, more uh, interlinkage uh, between different disciplines, specifically, as you have mentioned very well in education, 
uh, if you look today, we still educate people in silo. You know, we, we don't teach, for example, astronomy and biology, you know, together, you know, or we don't teach, you know, mathematics and physics together. Okay, we, we have an issue, in fact, because we are not able to teach uh, the entire linkage between the different, you know, disciplines. And when you, you, you learn the different disciplines together, you can see, you know, how they are, uh, how, how they are linked to each other. You know? And I think until we, we, we are not at this stage, you know, to have this type of uh, integration, and uh, for example, in, in uh, healthcare, we, we mentioned integrated, integrated people-centered health approach. You know, it is to, to be sure, you know, we have continuity of health services. But if you don't know what it is uh, the bridge uh, or what it is common between the different disciplines, you know, how you can do it. Okay, I think we need to, to really uh, shift again this, and we discussed that the mindset and, and to see the world, you know, uh, as as a, 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 a unity, in fact, not not uh, everything separate from each other. I think that is for me uh, critical if we want to move to something uh, more uh, based on on uh, the value like peace, you know, harmony, and and as well the the relationship we have with our environment and, and the respect, for example, for nature, you know, because we are the nature, but it's very important to, to, uh, to reconfigure, reconfigure uh, ourselves as well. And, and we, we are everything in this universe, you know, in this sense, uh, all, all the elements are linked to each other. So the, the concept of inter interdependency is very important, you know, specifically to, to put in practice uh, mutual respect, mutual uh, understanding, you know, and, and to go uh, more beyond uh, any type of uh, judgmental, you know, approach, because that uh, damage uh, a lot. For example, the critical thinking uh, have been mentioned by Lennart. Uh, and if you, you start to judge, you cannot have any uh, authentic uh, relationship or authentic dialogue or communication. Donc, we need to, to review as well, you know, uh, inside, you know, how we, we establish this type of relationship um, in our life. That it is my, my point. Thank you very much. Uh, we have uh, time uh, for four minutes uh, and Faris, uh, because uh, Janani and me would have uh, two minutes each uh, for ending this session that is going to end uh, punctually at 1.30 as agreed. Ferris. Just uh, very shortly uh, resume and uh, answering your question, Alberto, I completely agree with uh, Leonard. Uh, we have to build up the generation which is uh, going on to educate them and to prepare them to the, our goal of uh, 2030. Let us unite in common efforts. Let us empower ourselves and develop resilient and sustainable communities, societies and cultures. We cannot afford to miss the lesson and waste opportunity to learn a new and more effective ways of being. There is no doubt that overall pressing challenges we have will have profound and long lasting effects on the way we live and organize our societies, especially to our younger generation. As the VAS, World Academy of Art and Science and United Nations Office in Geneva is clearly thinking ahead and focus on strategies and transformative global leadership, we have to have a close, direct and important look on the way our education system will format, shape and influence upbringing and education of a new leader. I think this is one kind of the view that I can see according to your uh, answer, Alberto. Thank you. Thank you, Ferris. I'll leave uh, Janani to say the last words uh, since I started. Uh, you close it. Uh, I want to just to thank you all for your participation, uh, also the people that send uh, some questions, some we answer online, uh, some uh, by writing. I remind everybody that uh, we really should be grateful to all the people, we're gonna put all their name uh, in our web uh, that silent in the backdrop uh, are making this possible. And also 
that uh, there is uh, the link uh, for taking uh, for free not only this uh, uh, conference, the whole conference, even a year from now, and the supporting material. Uh, also, our journal are for free. And uh, let's join together because this, we need to do it together or it's going to be a big failure. Thank you. You all, Janani, close this session, please. Thank you, Alberto. It was wonderful listening to everybody and I couldn't agree with you anymore. I completely agree with the Leonard Levy. Education does hold the key. We see that everything is integrated because this lockdown and the physical isolation that it involved, it led to problems in mental health, people staying cooped inside. This led to, to so many issues like domestic violence. We cannot use a piecemeal approach to address this or that issue in isolation. So our thinking needs to be integrated, holistic. And uh, even to this, I believe education is the key. When our education is transdisciplinary, as Isabel just mentioned, as she described, we foster that integrated thinking. And I believe uh, the most, one of the most important points is actually a person-centered approach where uh, we inculcate values in our youngsters so our future leaders can uh, not just solve problems, but even you know, prevent them from occurring. All of these great comments that we have had, uh, we have uh, recorded this entire session, the comments, the questions, all of that will also be saved. And we will definitely be taking this conversation forward through our website and through our various forums. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good day. Bye-bye. Thank you. I'm ending the session. Thank you, Shashi.